everybody. Welcome to the first episode of Rumble, the Future of Urban Mobility Seminar Series. Today, our guest is Mr. David Pekaral from Shiva.ai. He's going to present for us the next connected experience, what is mobility is going to look like in the near future. So please, help me in welcoming Mr. David. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> After that, I would like to share some great news with you. So finally, today, Rumble Lights is live on Kickstarter. We launched earlier today at 8 a.m. in the morning, Eastern Time Zone. So please go ahead to kickstarter.com, look for Rumble Lights, and show us your love. Support us, spread the word, and let's learn more about Mr. David Pekarov. So actually, Mr. David Pickerel is the Chief Business Officer at Shiva.ai. David is committed to making mobility more effective, efficient, sustainable, and safe. He is the co-founder and Chief Business Officer of Shiva.ai. David worked at IBM as the Global Smarter Transportation Leader. He was an executive at Booz Allen Hamilton and a practicing attorney. So thank you very much, David, for being here with us. We appreciate the time, actually, you, you're giving us today to present about an excellent topic. So please go ahead, tell us more about yourself, about the future of connected mobility, about Shiva, and we're all yours. Okay, great. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, launch, I guess, launch my screen here. So we'll do that. All right. Um, da -da, okay. I got to reprogram how to think here now because I was not used to, I'm not used to not driving when I present. Um, okay. Well, anyway, like I said, we've already, we've already got the title, which is the next connected, the next connected experience. Uh, so let's go to the first slide here. I'll do this every time I want you to change slides rather than say change slides, which. Okay. I'll keep an eye on you. Then. <laughs> okay. So, um, so anyway, I mean, the, the the current state of mobility, despite the fact that we live in a very connected world, when it comes to most forms, if not all, of transportation, there's really not a lot of connectivity because connectivity really hasn't, you know, if you have a mobile device, you have an iPad, you have an iPhone, you have a television set, or a, you know, all of the entertainment functions are highly connected. But when it comes to transportation, automotive, riding, transit, um, everything is really not very connected. I mean, you can summon an Uber using one app, you can park maybe using another app, you can pay a toll, sometimes using your phone in some countries, but it's really not a connected experience at all. And uh, if you wanna purchase fuel, uh, you may be able to you know, pay for it with your, your, your wallet app, but it's still a very manual and critical in these times, a very contact oriented process where you have to basically punch in numbers uh, at a fuel stop. Uh, very contact-oriented policy where you have hundreds of people touching the same place at the same time, uh, or it's the same place during the day. Um, so it's, mobility is not a connected experience really much anywhere in the world. Uh, so that's kind of the problem we start out with is that how do you actually connect all of this with these different proprietary technologies? And again, so that, that sets a lot of the foundations for change. We'll move quickly to that. I mean, the real issue is, is around this ability to connect is the, is the ability of data. Um, and data is right now in a lot of different sources. You'll have smart parking machines that'll have it. You'll have tolling systems that'll gather a certain amount of data about vehicles. You'll have all manner of vehicle telematic systems, proprietary systems like, like OnStar that'll basically gather certain bits and pieces of data. Uh, and then your cell phone, will gather some data and that's not actually particularly good data. And I'll explain why that is, but you have mobile phones that gather data, but you have bits and pieces of data that aren't connected and really aren't smart data. They're just pieces of data that are used for a discrete particular operation and, and not for an integrated mobility environment. Um, and and essentially once you have smart data, uh, then you can have smart transportation, infrastructure, cities, everything layers on top of data. But the data problem is the first one that smart cities and smart transportation really need to fix before they can really have a seamless environment and a mobility environment 
in what's often called mobility as a service. That's the term that kind of originated in Finland about 15 or 20 years ago, but the idea of doing that, and I'll explain more what mobility as a service or MAS is in detail. Let's go to the next um, slide here, and here we go. Mobility as a service, I mean, the, it's the, the fundamental idea before I even dive into the slide is that MAS, the idea of MAS is rather than I'm a car driver, I have a transit pass, I ride the subways, I ride the metro, uh, I rent a bike uh, or I own a bike is the idea that rather than um, rather than saying I do this predominantly and I don't use the others that often the idea is you really and, and the idea the industry's had for years is that you buy a product whether that product is a bicycle which is hard to find in stores now because people are commuting on bicycles more than ever as Rumble of course knows and um, the um, or you buy a monthly transit pass, uh, or even in Helsinki, you can buy a monthly MOS pass, but it's still selling a thing. And, um, and at the same time, I, I still say that eventually, ultimately, car ownership is going to decrease. It's not decreasing as fast as it was under COVID, and I'll talk, talk more about COVID, but it's still going to gradually decrease because people in urban areas just don't want to deal with owning a car. They want to be environmentally sustainable. Um, they're going to make car driving more expensive in a lot of places and discourage it for environmental and social and everything else, everything else reasons. Um, and whether you own a car or not, people want a better mobility experience than saying, I'm not going to drive today, so I'll go down to the ticket kiosk and figure out how to ride the bus. People want a more seamless and dear experience and not be sold, you know, not necessarily be sold a vehicle that they're going to use all the time. Uh, again, and that goes to a journey, blade, the idea of journey planning. And the old mentality was, what do you normally do? I normally take the bus. Okay, so you buy a bus pass. Uh, or I own a car and find a place to put it in the garage and pay insurance on it and do all the other things you do and maintain it. Um, instead of thinking that way, the really the data centric model that newer generations and new technologies are allowing is going to be on the idea of it's really more of a relationship with the transportation ecosystem. Uh, and you basically select, rather than say, I'm going to do this all the time, you come out of your house or your apartment, wherever you are, and say, it's a nice day. I think I'll walk today or I'll get a bike today. Tomorrow it could be raining or it could be, you know, 45 degrees centigrade or 100 plus degrees Fahrenheit and say, it's too hot like it is now I'm in much of the world. So I think I will ride in an air conditioned car. So I'll call a TNC or a taxi or I'll rent a car on the street that I can drive around because it's much cooler, or I'm hauling things. So you look at each individual trip, even different legs of the same round trip, saying I'll ride out this evening, it's nice and cool, so I'll ride over to my friend's house. Tomorrow morning, when I come back from my friend's house in another city, it may be really hot, so then I will ride, I'll do something else, uh, or I'll take the train because the trains will be running. Um, the idea really too is getting away from fixed route or route, depending on, you know, Canadians say one, Americans say the other. Um, get away from fixed route services um, where there's a scheduled bus that stops every 20 minutes versus the idea of couldn't I do on-demand transportation planning and basically get picked up by a bus in front of my house at a particular time rather than have to wait. And that kind of, I've noted there that on-demand services has kind of existed in much place in, in, in much of the world um, where you go out and drive. I think, I think it's Saturday, they call them Superman, where you go get the Superman van and drive to the next town or drive to the next city. They call them Mashlutna taxis, where my wife is from in Russia, where you go to the railway station, they leave when they're full and they ride around the neighborhood. And then they also kind of cruise around the neighborhood and you flag them down. Now you don't have to even wait there and flag them down. You can get a nap and they'll have it come pick you up. Um, and then the last item, of course, is the big change that we've all dealt with in the last four months. A lot of this has changed by COVID-19, where people that have been using very communal forms of transportation, like trams or metros, simply aren't going to do it because they're trying to avoid spreading the disease. Most governments are discouraging people that don't have to from taking mass, mass transit so that they can have increased social distancing. And, and that's going to really start driving how people look for new forms of transportation that they may not have used before that are more personalized and have less people on them rather than ride a bus with a hundred other people or something like that. We'll go to the next one. 
And again, this gets back to, I've kind of already covered most of this, but the idea of it is really based on the need to exchange data. You're going to need to know how many people are going where, um, what the demographics are, how many people typically need to ride from this neighborhood to this subway station. Um, and you basically, your, your, your data to some extent will follow you around as a user. Um, on one hand, on the extreme, for those concerned about privacy, a lot of the data for, that cities need for planning is fully needs is fully anonymized because they don't need to know that it's you, me, or any other individual person that's riding on the bus. They need to know, and cities don't really want to know, neither do most private companies. They don't need to know the names of the 20 people that ride this on-demand service every hour from this street, but they need to know that it's 20 people reliably, or that it's five people on this block, so that they can plan services to be there. Conversely, the user voluntarily will want to have a lot of, to some degree, have personalized services around them. If they have a special need um, and they want to basically have, you know, they need a paratransit type vehicle, they need, uh, you know, they're, they're elderly or something and they need help getting into the vehicle or they don't have, they're not sighted and they need to be able to have technology for blind or hearing impaired or mobility impaired uh, or just have certain preferences where they, what they want to do, what they want to buy, uh, maybe even what kind of coffee they get when they get off of the um, of the train at, at their favorite stop and say I'll get off the I'll get off whatever I'm riding right now or park my bike and go in this cafe and have a coffee before I go to work or before I go to dinner or whatever. Um, so the personalization, which is voluntary, combined with the demographics, which is anonymized, so that you're not giving up any of your personal data anywhere. That, uh, that that you're you're not supposed to. It's obviously Europe's the biggest challenge with the GDPR, but most countries have some degree of data privacy protection. And privacy has been kind of a big staller for a lot of development because they're worried about privacy, and they should be. But now the ability to anonymize people from the data um, and gather the needed data about who's using it versus simply having a lot of personal data that's very liability intensive to store and having um, and having other uh, and having other routes to, to deal with that. Um, and again, I've kind of talked about public-private partnerships a little bit. Uh, I, again, all of these uh, all of these are going to be integrated. Uh, I, the key issue is that government, and I think this is happening under COVID. COVID is kind of driving this change. Before you had Uber and Lyft over here competing with government transit agencies around the world or with taxis. Now people are realizing they've got to cooperate and there's room for everybody everywhere, but you can't just randomly compete with each other. There's got to be coordination, whether it's a formal partnership or whether it's a coordination and with Uber getting involved with transit. Um, and you're starting to see that with companies like Via, which is owned 30% owned by Daimler, uh, a car company providing micro transit. You're seeing that public-private collaboration. So let's go to the next slide. I'll get into the use cases for just a minute here, and then we can have some discussions and, 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 uh, and conversations here. Um, important consumer point is that when consumers, my wife just bought a car a couple of months ago, uh, when consumers buy cars, six out of 10 car buyers now want some kind of connected vehicle service, you know, whether it's Bluetooth hooking to their phone, whether it's emergency crash notification if they crash, which is what OnStar was founded on. But most car drivers now want connected vehicle features. Not just young people here, but older people. My father still drives uh, carefully at age 85, but he would like to have more when he buys his next car shortly and he's going to buy another one soon he wants to have vehicles that'll help him be safer when he drives he doesn't drive at night but he's still concerned is my reaction time as good as it was when i was 35 as it is 85 of course it's not no matter how experienced he is so older drivers or disabled drivers want to have features that make them safer drivers despite the fact that they have age or physical impairments so it's a it's a big market out there is, is this thing this is not just a niche uh, adoption thing go to the next fun no sorry please. and again covid we've kind of talked this already you know the idea of one the idea of having contactless payment uh the guy idea of having uh, reduced human interaction uh, and then uh, the idea of managing fleets of vehicles, because there'll be a lot of shared fleets. Car ownership will go down. I don't think the number of cars will go down as much. It's just a lot of operators will start building for fleet environments 
in normal, more normal, where they rent with apps. And uh, of course, you know, with fleet operations, the ability to track the vehicles, the ability to have people clean the vehicles now uh, after they've been used for disinfecting for COVID is important. Vehicles are going to need to be entered into and cleaned, or if they're when they become autonomous, they're going to need to go somewhere where they can be sanitized. Um, if there's a need for that, hopefully COVID. By the time we have connected vehicle or autonomous vehicles, I'm hoping we've dealt with COVID. But right now, the idea is how do we deal with this cleaning situation, and how do we have people not touch parking meters and gas pumps and things like that? Let me go to the next one, and I'll give a couple of quick use cases that that, that Shiva, uh, which was originally has just been renamed from Parkophone. Our original name was Parkophone in parking, and our original use study, which we we did in New York and are still doing it in New York, and also in are ongoing in Detroit, uh, and will resume once the once the once the pandemic crisis passed, Is the idea is we use really precise satellite-based location technology to basically geofence parking spaces, individual parking spaces. Typical cell phone has a has an accuracy of about 30 meters. With our technology, we have an accuracy, accuracy of one to two meters and increasingly getting smaller so that we can geofence individual parking spaces. So our system can basically know where you are within about a meter, identify an individual parking space, reserve the parking space for you, guide to the parking space, you park in that space, and then like it says, you walk away. Our system in the back office will take care of the payments. Uh, it'll take care of renewing it. You won't have a meter expired, um, and it'll pay you. And if you have to leave your, um, your the site because there's limited you can only park there for two hours or four hours or what have you. It'll keep track of that and keep reminding you you either need to move your car uh, or, or we're going to make a payment for it or, or you have to do something else so that you don't get a violation. Now talking about another use case here real quick. And that's one we started to work on more recently is automated fuel payments. And this is going to be this is kind of our COVID focused response where, um, where we, um, uh, you basically, the same deal as the parking space, the, par the, the uh, system will identify you. If you want it to, it'll even let you, it'll even check your fuel state and it may even offer you a discount if you're a commercial buyer saying, if you buy from us, you'll you know, pay, you know, half a euro less per liter or something like that. Uh, but it identifies that saying you need to go to a fuel station or a charging station for electric vehicles, which is going to become increasingly common. It drives you to the charging or fuel station. You can park at that pump. It identifies your vehicle. Um, you can then fuel it. Um, if uh, some of the, some of them may eventually have the systems where somebody else will come in and put the, the thing in, so you don't have to get out of your car, put it in the nozzle or the charger, uh, and it pays for it right there. And it's totally contactless. All you have to do is basically go where it tells you you're there. The, sit, the service station will fuel you and drive away. You don't even have to get out of your vehicle, much less touch a gas pump or a gas nozzle. Um, so the electronic fuel card is a big uh, project that we have a lot of energy companies around the world are interested in doing. Uh, and and in being, in it, being able to integrate charging as charge station availability is often a critical issue compared to fueling where there's only so many charging stations now. Managing the influx of people wanting a charging station, particularly on long trips where they want to pull in, get right in the charger, charge quickly, and then get back on their long trip. So that fuel and charging is part of the next use case that we're interested in. But I think that's, I think that's it for fuel. No, there's in-car payments, which is kind of the same thing where you want to stop and buy food, you want to stop and, and buy supplies while you're traveling. You don't necessarily want to go into somewhere and walk around a store on the conditions of COVID and that can be integrated in it too. You can basically order someone in the car that's not driving can order things on the app uh, at a few at a food station or, or at a coffee station and rather than do that you all have to do is pull into the station. The system knows where you are. It can alert the people to say bring this person's groceries or food or whatever they want out there and give it to them and have contactless delivery in the parking lot or in front of where they buy stuff. And that's another, it, with the idea of your, your car becoming a basically huge digital wallet like your phone is now with Apple Pay and those functions like that and digitizing it. And um, I think there's one more slide. I'll talk about the credit card aspect of it. No, I didn't mention it. I'll mention the credit, I took that slide out. The, the other aspect of it too is there's a real desire, frankly, to get around traditional credit card transactions because that 
takes, they're very inefficient and credit card companies around the world charge about 3% for processing those payments. And if you can do it in a back office tied to the vehicle, that number can be brought much less lower so that you're paying close to 0% uh, or no percent for these transactions. And they're simply processed as part of the value the service provides rather than paying, you know, two, three, sometimes even four or 5% for credit transactions uh, and, and kind of cutting the credit card companies out. Credit card companies understand this too. So a lot of them are interested in modernizing. So I think that's it. I left a few, I left a few less minutes because we were having some technical difficulties, uh, but let's go ahead uh, for those that are on and see if there are any questions I can answer in the last couple of minutes. Sure, so thank you very much for a perfect and amazing actually presentation. Like really the sky is the limit when it comes to talking about the future of technology. Um, so I would like to ask everyone to unmute their microphone if they have a question. And until they do so, I have actually a question. So I'm going to start uh, with asking you a question about slide number nine. So That's here good. you were actually telling us about um, the technology you guys are working on at Shiva, uh, AI to specifically allocate or the car using GPS or satellite technologies. So yeah. most of the time when I ask or request Uber or Lyft, especially in New York City, I never find my Uber or Lyft in the same place that yeah. I went before. So can we use the same technology to simplify finding for um, like finding your car in general or find it, finding your right, so to speak? Yeah, let me tell you why, the, why that's different. And I mentioned a couple of times that cell phones, mobile phones, I used to work for Verizon at one point. Mobile phones are almost useless because mobile phone companies, or they call them MNOs, mobile network operators, use... Um, use the telephone, use the devices um, and the location technology really just to kind of identify their own subscribers or people that are roaming onto the network, identify the users and then get them attached to a data so itself, you know, either a wide area network data or voice cell phone. And that's all it's used for. It's used to connect with their users. They don't really care about precision functions, which is why 30 meters or more location accuracy of a mobile phone. It's why your Uber driver can't find you because he or she may be on the other side of the block or halfway down the street. Um, what our technology does simply, it eliminates what's known as multipath effect. And multipath effect is why mobile phones are very much anywhere, but they're really not accurate in places like Manhattan or downtown Riyadh where there are buildings, where they're bouncing off of buildings. Um, and you get different signals reflected of the different objects. And between all those different reflections, you can't tell where the, 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 the unit really is. We, um, we um, with, with what we do, our algorithm eliminates multipath effect. It essentially looks at all these signals and figures out very accurately where the vehicle really is uh, or the, the device really is. And, um, path effect is why we, you, we, we suggest using our technology rather than your mobile phone because of that accuracy. So you can do a parking space, you can do a payment, you can do almost anything because then you now know within a, we're going to try to get it under a meter, but we're now at one to two meters and you'll know exactly where the person is or the unit is they can use that. I'd also note we use a device now, a device that fits on the dashboard that can be transferred. Eventually we'll be integrated into the vehicle itself and won't even need a separate device. We're already working with what are known as tier one suppliers to make that happen. Uh, but that's the idea is your car becomes your mobile transponder and the, you know, and also for privacy issues, it's pertinent to the vehicle not the individual, unless you stick the transponder in your back pocket and start walking around somewhere with it, which is not what we recommend. You just put it on the dashboard, so it's the vehicle, not the, we're focusing on the vehicle, not the user, which is another privacy thing we're, we're covering around the world, particularly in Europe and GDPR. Got it. So I thought uh, we had a question or two, but I actually went and uh, muted the microphone. So guys, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, first, I want to say uh, uh, it's really amazing the 
all the things that you talk about the technology. Uh, like Green, I, I already have, I live in Lisbon and I suffer sometimes with the Uber to, they pick me in the right side of the road. And uh, I actually rented for a while the jump bikes from the Uber mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's possible like really close to the point in the map. So uh, those technology you talk about, uh, they are already in the market, and if not, how long to be uh, to be accessed for us? Like, just to understand how how is this is going to be soon? Because I, I see okay. in the cut, they yeah. have the kind of the basket that you put the products. They already calculate the, the price of the things that you pay, and you can pay by yourself by the car. But it's like a one step bef ahead uh, before actually. So those technologies you say about the, the, the fuel payments and the car, finding the parked car, are this, those things like uh, in the short future or is something like more distance from the... Our it's pretty near, particularly, it particularly in, I have to say particularly in Lisbon. And I was actually, I was actually in Lisbon in February for Smart Open Lisbon. Yeah. And I've done a lot of interaction. Lisbon's probably going to be one of the first countries in Europe to do it. Um, yeah. You know, probably it's, it's going to be a question of whether it's going to be Lis Lis Lisbon or whether so it's going to be Portugal or Italy. Yeah. The cities in Portugal are very interested in doing this. They have an open yeah. parking thing that the city of yeah. Lisbon is doing right now. Um, the Lisbon tourism is very interesting because particularly with yeah. COVID-19, people are going to come from different parts of Europe and drive to Portugal to go to the Algarve rather than fly in. Yeah, so yeah. I would say within probably the next year um certainly ours is going to start being available fairly soon through various we're going to probably come through car manufacturers i would say in your fueling companies and in your e-retail you're going to probably see this appear somewhere in port in portugal within the next year or so okay we're, we're working around covid but portugal will probably be one of the show places for doing it first um so it's not a long way off because yeah, yeah. that's amazing that's amazing yeah I, I I can see here they are especially like you said with the, the the tourism, we have like a lot of things that they are happening here, mm -hmm. so that's why I was curious because this that's really really amazing the idea of, of the auto payment fuels especially and the the parking that you find the parking and and walk away, so I was really curious if it was something like really close to our reality or, or something more it's really close more yeah, it's it's close reality and i think it's going to show up in, it may well show up in portugal first uh you you've got yeah. the energy companies are interested in it, the tourism companies are interested in it so it'll probably come pretty quickly that's amazing it's amazing okay. excellent so do we have any other question i mean I see a chat question from mahmoud yeah please um, go ahead and take is what will drive the transformation of traditional transportation to IoT and smart AI technology. Um, yeah, he's having mic problems, but I got the question. I mean, what's going to really drive the, is, frankly, the old way of doing stuff. I, you kind of saw my first slide. It's so, the, the current system is so incredibly inefficient because transportation is not digitized. And you have random competition between transit agencies and, and, and you have, different Uber, Lyft, all these different, you know, companies. And the only way to really organize, and they're competing with each other and they're both losing money. Cities are losing tons of money on transit that no one rides even before COVID-19. And, you know, Uber, Lyft, all of these other transportation network companies are losing investor dollars left and right. It's horribly inefficient. So even without that, even without putting COVID in the mix, it was ridiculously inefficient and they weren't managing their resources or their fleets or their customer relationships well at all from this disconnected and stovepipe environment. Add on top of that COVID and there's going to be even more of a need for efficiency if more people are driving now rather than taking transit because they want to have personal transportation then you have people needing to be able to park places or find route routing that can get them around stuff. So it's making it even more necessary for efficiency. Uh, in the US, I just checked, even as COVID continues to be a huge problem here, rural traffic is up 
100% to levels of pre-pandemic, and urban traffic is up 90% of levels of pre-pandemic, and it's going to go past all levels once everyone really gets back to work and starts going back and be like a, probably 150% in cities. So people are going to need to be able to navigate. They're going to be able to find places to fuel. They're going to need to find places to park. So the, the need for contactless is, it was a problem that I've been talking about for 20 years. It got worse and worse and worse and worse. And COVID is effectively going to push it over the top all over the world because people are going to need to be able to uh, to be connected. Yeah. Yeah, it's impressive. So they'll do that. And, we'll, you know, and I, I don't think that, I think I said in the beginning, I think, um, connect you know the car ownership is going to go down uh and i think ultimately will but i think there's going to be a lot of people driving the idea that cars are going to disappear is not is not going to be a realistic expectation and of course reem and i were just talking before the, the call started saudi arabia now has twice as many potential drivers as it did two years ago <laughs> so people there are going yes. to drive. obviously people are going to now that you have women drivers in saudi arabia they're going to want to drive and be connected and um so the, the demand is not going to go down. And even if you rent cars, you're going to need to be able, even if you rent cars through share card systems, you're going to have to park it somewhere. So I think it's going to go quickly. And again, I think early adopters will be Europe and I think Portugal in particular, because uh, it's they're, amazing. They're, they're just doing some neat stuff there. Excellent. Google Smart Open Lisbon, you'll see a lot of stuff that we worked on earlier part of this year. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. So. Uh, yeah, do you guys have any other questions? Because we have one minute left and then we are going to wrap up. I have just one more actually. Sure, go ahead. You're talking about the money that we are losing with those, all those situations that we have, especially with the transportations. I'm from Brazil actually. Mm -hmm. And here I can see those things happening. But in Brazil, I don't go there like two years ago. Well, I just moved here like two years ago. Uh, how do you see the connections of the private companies that work with communications? Uh, with transportations and the public ones because as I see in Brazil we have like I'm going to be an example like Uber and the, the transportation we have like public ones they, we don't have like connections to to work together like you said in the beginning do you think there's a, a, a solution for that to the private companies that work with transportation and public ones to work together yeah. somehow. Well, COVID is already driving that. I mean, first of all, even before COVID started, Uber is losing billions and billions of investors yeah. because they're competing. What you're going to start seeing is by necessity, whether it's a public private partnership or not, yeah. you're going to see government working with industry. Uh, VIA is that model. VIA is actually replaced transit in Arlington, Texas, for example. Uh, with on-demand uh, microtransit. So it's just too expensive for them not to do it otherwise. So you, if it, whether you call it a formal partnership or whether they can cooperate saying, we'll run these bus routes in this city and then people will take microtransit. And if people need subsidized microtransit or TNC service, it's cheaper. It may be less expensive to subsidize than it is to... Um, than to simply provide service that no one rides or only a few people ride. Okay. Okay. I see more of this kind of ideas when you see yeah. like bike sharing. You, see, you yeah. can see that that works more together with the public transportation. It's like we have the spot, the place that you can find it. It's more like you, can, you see the connections. They are more close to the public and the, the private. So that uh, was... was they're going to have to work together. They can't afford not, either can afford not to. Uh, and I, let me ask you real quick before I know Reem's going to wrap it up. The question, sure. do you think you're going to see more supportive of cyclists uh, with the cyclists and saving the environment? Um, due to the fact that people aren't rising transit and it, it's going to be driven by, transit, by the pandemic, but it'll help the environment. London, New York, tons of other cities are building more bike lanes or dedicating more space for bicycles for people riding yeah. so i think for the cycling community that to wrap up where rumble lights is most focused i think yeah. the amount of people taking bicycles is going to go up because that's transportation you control and transportation that you own or that you can easily access so i think cycling is taking a big jump because of the pandemic and i think that'll be good for obviously what Rumble does and what Rumble Lights does. So I think those are coming. They're already coming. Those were announced earlier. So, yeah, Toronto. So, yeah, that's another place where they're doing it. People are not going to ride the TTC red cars if it's with a bunch of other people or squash onto the 
subway on Bloor and Young. It's too whatever, too messy. Yeah, exactly, exactly. exactly. So it's going to drive. We, we, COVID can be. I hate to call COVID an opportunity, but it's going to push a lot of things that a lot of us have wanted: cycling and better transit and micro transit have wanted for years, even decades. This is going to be the catalyst that's going to push this through. People will get used to it and say, well, I really like riding the bike more. I really like having a more communal environment or having this ability to do that. And it'll create more sustainable transportation as a long-term effect uh, for doing that. So. Excellent. So thank you very much, David, for a great presentation, great discussion. Um, this is wonderful, like seeing all these pieces of transportation coming together and actually um, utilizing the benefit of technology to improve things around us. This is amazing. Um, thanks, David, for your time. Thank you for the yeah. valuable information. Thank you all for um, joining us today for your amazing questions and interaction. So yeah, thanks, thanks again. So I will send you all the link after publishing this video to YouTube. So stay tuned. Thank you all. Absolutely. Talk to you later. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Bye.